Welcome back. Remember a long time ago uh, we started the course talking about slopes of tangent lines and then I, uh, I, I mentioned uh, that we really need to focus on limits for a while and we studied 2.2 to 2.6. We've been learning about limits and continuity. Uh, now we're coming back. We're going to spend the rest of the quarter talking about slopes of tangent lines now that we know a little bit about limits, okay? Um, so we're going to, going to in, this, in this first part one we're going to do, define what the slope of the tangent line means using limits and we'll look at some interpretations of the slope of the tangent line and then in part two we'll look at some more uh, specific examples, okay? Anyway, so if, let, let's use a, a Capolini noodle here to represent the, the secant line. Uh, let's see, Capolini noodles work pretty good. Of course, a spaghetti noodle would work well. Um, I probably wouldn't go with a, a linguine or a fettuccine here though. Anyway, um, so uh, as the Q point gets close to P, wouldn't you agree the secant line is getting close to the tangent line, right? Uh, in this first example, another way to say that is as X gets close to A, right? So, so the way we would define the secant line first, the slope of the secant line, I mean, wouldn't the slope of the secant line from P to Q be F of X minus F of A over X minus A? And then the slope of the tangent line at x equal a, we're asking what is the slope getting close to as these points get close together. Remember, you can say that x gets close to a. So it, that's a limit, isn't it? The limit is x gets close to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. We don't care what happens when x equal a. In fact, if x equals a, the, the slope is undefined. It's what is it getting close to, isn't it? Uh, this second, we've seen that before. This second one, uh, we're actually going to use more. We're going to use this form of the slope of the tangent line even more than the first one. Here, uh, let's see if this were the secant line, we're asking what is the slope of the secant line getting close to as Q, point Q gets close to point P. Another way to say that here would be as A plus H gets close to A, or you could just say H gets close to zero, where H is this X distance change, right? Alright, so the slope of the secant line from P to Q would be change in y, f of a plus h minus f of a over change in x. a plus h minus a is just h. That's the good old difference quotient, isn't it? So the slope of the tangent line at uh, x equal a, it's the limit, in this case, as, as h goes to zero of this, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Remember, we don't care what happens when h equals zero. In fact, if h equals zero, it's undefined. It's what happens as it gets close to it. All right. Uh, let's see. There's one more uh, form we're going to use. Uh, not as much. You might see this in other books, actually, but I still want to talk about it. Um, and as this point Q gets close to the point P, and instead of calling this h, let's call it delta x. Delta x is this change in x. So as Q gets close to the point P, the secant line gets close to the tangent line. Uh, that's the same thing as saying delta x gets close to zero. So we could say that the slope of the secant line from P to Q is f of a plus delta x minus f of a over delta x. By the way, if we call this change in y distance delta y, you couldn't you also just think of it as good old delta y over delta x? And then the slope of the tangent line at x equals a is the limit, in this case, as delta x goes to zero of f of a plus delta x minus f of a over delta x, which is the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x. Okay, so that, that's the third way we're going to talk about the slope of the tangent line. All right, the moment of truth. Here's the definition. The slope of the tangent line to f of x at x equal a by the way, we also call that the derivative of f of x at x equal a. And the notation we use, a nice compact way to write it, is f prime at a. This is the derivative, or the slope of the tangent line, when x equals a. And then uh, you, you could always consider that the instantaneous rate of change in f of x at x equal a. Um, this is a nice way to say it also. You don't see that as often. Uh, the slope of the curve f of x at x equal a is nice because it reinforces what the tangent line means. What the slope of the tangent line means, I should say. And then so we have these three ways to define it. There's actually four here. Uh, the second one is the way that we're going to talk about it the most. 
we're going to use, believe it or not, we're going to use the second one more often than the others. Okay? All right. Well, the last thing I want to talk about today is I want to talk about some interpretations of the, the derivative or the slope of the tangent line. Um, we've seen this first one before. If the function stands for the distance traveled in miles as a function of t in hours, then if you look at the slope of the secant line, isn't that change in distance over change in time? That's the average velocity. And then as the time interval gets small, the average velocity is getting close to the instantaneous velocity. So in, in, the limit would be the instantaneous velocity, say at some value of t. By the way, if you hear the word velocity, and I don't say the instantaneous velocity, it's assumed that means the instantaneous velocity. But let's look at some other functions here. What if the function is the population, uh, people in, in millions of years, say of a, of a, of a, of a city uh, after, after t years, then what would the slope of the secant line be? Uh, the, the trick here is, look at the units. The units would be um, millions of people per year. So what is that? Isn't that the average growth rate? And then uh, as the time interval gets small, the average growth rate is getting close to the instantaneous growth rate at a specific time. The, the units would be millions of people per year. Okay, a couple more. What if the function is the volume of water? Well, let's say v of t represents the total volume of water that's flowed out of a reservoir after t hours. It's measured in cubic kilometers. So look, look at the units. The units would be cubic kilometers per hour. So what is that measuring? Isn't that the average flow rate, right? And then as the time interval gets small, what is the limit as, say, delta t goes to zero of the average flow rate? Wouldn't that be the flow rate, or you could say the instantaneous flow rate? And the units would be the same, cubic kilometers per hour. A couple more here. Here we go. One you might be able to relate to. What if the function stands for, the function is p of t, and it stands for the number of pages of a chemistry book you've read after t hours. Then the change in y over change in x, the change in pages over change in time, the units would be pages per hour, would be the average reading rate, wouldn't it? The average reading rate. So what do you think that would be about? It wouldn't be very big, would it? Uh, and then, at a specific time, is as the time interval gets smaller and smaller, this is getting close to the instantaneous reading rate, isn't it? Uh, units would be pages per hour. Okay, last one. What if we're talking about g of t is the grade that you earn on a uh, calculus exam coming up, say, after studying for t hours? Uh, if you look at the units, let's say your, your grade is measured in points, decimal points. So, so the units would be points earned, right, per hour studied. So so what is that? Points per hour, is that somehow a measure of how well you're studying? What if it were zero? That wouldn't be good. What if it were like eight? That would be pretty good. Eight points per hour. For each hour of studying, you're improving your grade by eight points. That doesn't sound too bad. Anyway, isn't it a measure of how efficient you are at studying? That's what I would say. Isn't it your average studying efficiency. It's the average studying efficiency. So the instantaneous, the slope of the tangent line, the derivative here at a specific time would be your instantaneous studying efficiency. And the units would be points per hour. So let's say your friend calls at a specific time and, you, and you're not doing your homework and you're talking to your friend, your studying efficiency isn't very good at that point, is it? It would be like zero, wouldn't it? Anyway, or if it's uh, early in the morning, you have a pot of coffee or a, some tea or something, you're studying really hard, it might be pretty good. Well, I hope you do well on the exam coming up here. 
Talk to you later.